So, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee for What Matters to Me and Why, I'd very much uh, like to welcome you to this talk. I'm Jonathan Fung, a faculty member in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. <coughs> How many of you have actually been to one of these uh, before this year? Ah, okay, wow. so now I realize that when I describe the series again for the sixth time, I'm boring <laughs> a large fraction of you. So um, let me try to keep the remarks brief then. Okay, for those of you who have not been here before, a uh, very large welcome to you. This is the first season of What Matters to Me and Why at UC Irvine. And uh, the goal of this series really is to be something quite different from the usual academic talks here on campus. Um, every month we gather to hear uh, from someone who through their daily activities really helps shape uh, UC Irvine, in many cases leads um, the development of UC Irvine. And uh, those people are asked simply to answer the question, what matters to me and why, and take it whatever, wherever that leads them, whatever they'd like to talk about. Um, typically they will talk about their values, motivations, beliefs, things that shape their uh, personal history and uh, how that motivates them to do uh, what they do with passion today. Uh, these are meant to draw together staff, faculty, students from the campus and to really be a celebration in many ways of the diversity and all sorts of spectra that we have on campus and also to celebrate the common uh, bonds that we have together. So, uh, in a second, I will introduce Doug Haynes, who will introduce our speaker. So let me first give some housekeeping announcements. First, uh, you all have, or many of you have lunches. Please bring them with you when you leave. We'd like to be good stewards of this uh, wonderful colloquium room here in the United Gateway. Second, this talk is being filmed, as you uh, no doubt have seen. If you do not want to appear on film, please move to the back of the room or somewhere where the cameras are. Third, uh, you were all given questionnaires as you came in the door. Uh, please fill them out. When the few of us proposed this series to the Chancellor almost uh, exactly a year ago, uh, we had no real idea of where it was going to go and what was going to happen. Uh, but I'm very happy to say that it appears that the second season is on solid financial footing. And so we will have a second season, and we will have seven more spots for new speakers. And so we very much encourage you to um, give us your suggestions. Um, you can either do that with these written questionnaires, or of course there are a number of people in the organizing committee sitting here in this room. Um, maybe I can ask all of the organizers to raise your hand. I know that um, at least four or five of us can yeah, raise you in the back there. So all the people who raise their hand are people who, yeah, or you could email one of us. Uh, but you could, if you want to talk face to face and give your impressions, suggestions, comments on the series, um, please talk to one of us here. That would be fantastic, too. Okay, and last, let me just remind you that uh, we have one more talk this academic year. That will be next month, uh, May 8th, another Wednesday at noon. Uh, Jeanette Castellanos, a lecturer in the School of Social Sciences and director of the Social Sciences Academic Research Center will be giving our last talk, and I don't think you want to miss it. It should be fantastic. So now, let me yield the floor to Doug Haynes from the History Department to let you discuss the Thank you, Jonathan. I want to thank you all for taking the time on this beautiful spring day to attend and participate <coughs> in this new campus tradition, what matters to me and why. What I particularly value about this program is that it brings together members of the campus as a creative community to learn more about each other, meet new people, and forge new and renew existing connections. It is a collective creative process that involves speaking, listening, and sharing. Each month, a speaker describes their personal story. The milestones that led them to UCI, such as birth, education, and career, are familiar. Yet, it is primarily through understanding their choices and decisions that enrich and connect us because of our diversity. I am especially honored to introduce my colleague, Professor Ningugi Wathiango. Born in Kenya, Nungugi Wapiango is a celebrated writer. 
and distinguished professor of comparative literature and English in the School of Humanities. I'm especially happy to be able to announce for the first time to the campus that Googie has just been selected as the 2013 UCI medalist. This is the highest honor that the UCI campus can bestow, and there will be a special festivities at the medal event in the fall of 2013. Googie's vast published body of writing, which stands before you, has been translated into over 30 languages. It spans more than five decades, comprises a rich variety of genres, plays, novels, memoirs, criticism, and commentary, and encompasses the local and global horizons of lived and imagined experience and possibilities. It probes life and death, family and community, state and nation, power and authority, and justice and peace. Googie's perspective and interventions bears witness to the enormous promise and sometimes tragic limitations of the human condition. Please join me in welcoming Guy Wakiyango. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's so wonderful uh, to see all of you here at the lunch hour. And uh, one or two warnings I have to give you. I've just come back from New York. I came back last night at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and the week before, I was in Stockholm and, you know, and other places. So if I fall asleep, <laughs> <laughs> All you have to do is listen, because I dream a lot when I'm asleep. <laughs> so you listen to my dreams. <laughs> Not my snoring, <laughs> but my, uh, my you know, dreams. Now, uh, if my wife is here, and Jerry, so she knows my stories and my dreams and my snorings. <laughs> uh, Anyway, let me start simply by saying that what and answer this question right away. What matters to me is actually listening to stories. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to illustrate in a few minutes. I came here, uh, Doug called me, I think, two days ago. I was in a hotel room at Rathagas University. And it reminded me about this today. Of course, I was remembering, but uh, I did not make it to him that I was remembering. So I want to give him a little bit of a heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, but I, he told me to be here by quarter two. 12, I think. But I got here at quarter to 11. So you can see my enthusiasm was quite great. <laughs> and then something magical really happened when I was here. I don't want to share that with you. Outside there, I, I even not, I visualized the place outside there. You know, A lady by the name of Sue came to me, you know, and she said, you know, I know your wife. And she gave me one of your books, one of your memoirs, which I'm reading or I've read. And she enjoyed it. Then I said, you see, this, I like memoirs because everybody has a story to tell. And I said, you have a story to tell. I said, oh, no, 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 my hand. <laughs> no, no, you have a story to tell. Because everybody, what has happened to them, you know. 
And I know in the course I was talking, she tells me this incredible story, <laughs> how she came to be a musician, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and uh, then I learned she has, in fact, you know, uh, uh, recorded, I think, three, you know, uh, you know, she had three records or something like that, you know. And not, then her story was connected, it also has romance in it. Because the person she fell in love with was playing this uh, bass. And when she met him, apparently, she was not staring at him, she was staring at the bass and the way the fingers <laughs> were moving. And he's trying to play the piano and other things. But now she's with this, it's like magic. And then he noted her looking at the bass and she, he says, wouldn't you like to play, and to play? That's how she came to learn to play. So her music, her heart, I, I mean, are all connected. And now she's here in the writing program, I think at, uh, Sue, are you around here? I'm sorry, I don't want to, ah, yeah, she's there. <laughs> so I don't tell you of him. Okay, now, uh, is that correct? Close. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying not to add, to show there is drama in the very there's a story in each one of us in every day of you know our lives. Then there's more to come. I come here. I was sitting here, and Jonathan Feng came and introduced himself. Where is Jonathan? Where well, he was here. Huh? Then he was talking about the series. Then I asked him, what do you do? Physics. What do you do in physics? Say, oh, the origin of the world. <laughs> and I'm sitting here. <laughs> yeah. Who knows about the origin? <laughs> Is that amazing? I mean, it's so magical uh, moment. So I want to have two more stories that happened. Just like okay. the other one who came to see me was uh, what's her name? What's her name? The lady who came. Oh, Tracy. To, Tracy. Is she here? Tracy. Uh, oh, she's at the back. Okay. Sorry, I have to tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> she came here. Of course, introduced herself. I was sitting over there. And um, I showed her my books. They are translations into many languages in the world. They are there. And I was telling her, oh, you know, I write in French. I write in Norwegian. I write in Japanese, in Spanish. I said, and I, And then I told her she got on to what I was saying. <laughs> but it reminded me of another thing happened to one of, uh, one of her assistants in the department when she just came. And I told her the same thing. As I write in Spanish, I mean comparative literature, mm -hmm. I was enjoying myself. And in comparative literature, you get to know many languages. So I write in German and blah, 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 and so I went on and on and on. And her mother was going, you write in all those languages? <laughs> OK. Uh, the story is important. Uh, and listen to stories, because it's magic. And I want to tell you, to share with you how I came into realization about the importance of the story, listening to stories. And so I want to talk about my mother. Because my mother, my mother's house, and my father's house, my father's household, who had four wives. My mother was the third wife of my father. You know, it's there in a rural community that I learned to listen to stories, OK? Now, my mother could not read or write, okay? But she's the one who sent me to school. 
So imagine this. In the evening, I grew up listening, literally listening to stories. There were so magic moments at night around. You can see the cinematic effect of that. You are sitting by the fireside, you know, so, you know, there's a crowd of you. Just one visualize cinematic thing, okay? So there's light is playing on your faces, you know, and the shadows are, you know, how they do that, especially when you don't have, uh, not electric light, the firelight, yes, firelight, the, the flames are always dancing, you know, so the light is playing, you know, on your faces, so it's kind of magical thing about shadows, and as you know, the cinema, they don't like dress, and painting and all that, they work on the idea of shadows on our faces. If you look at the person sitting next to you, the only thing that makes us be reckless, our identity comes really from, our identity of things comes from the play of shadows and light on everything. I mean, you, you cannot, when you look at your neighbor, the reason you are able to recognize them really is because their profile is to do the play of light and, um, and shadows. Okay. Now, so it was a kind of cinematic moment every evening. But there was a problem because they told us, and I've told this story in my book, Dreams in a Time of War, because they told us that we could only hear stories at night, not in daytime. And in daytime, stories ran away. They only came back in the evening. In other words, they, they didn't come to interfere with the work, really. <laughs> that's what they're saying. They come in the evening, you know. Uh, and then she sent me to school. Remember, she could not read or write, OK? But by sending me to school, she made me discover that I could actually tell myself stories in daylight. That's very, very important. So first of all, and she told me something else which I won't share with you, but let me see if first of all, read to you about that. Uh, in those days, uh, by the way, uh, <coughs> I was born in 1938. <laughs> okay, I know why you're wondering, where is, which century is that? <laughs> It is actually 20th century, <laughs> the first half of 20th century, okay? <laughs> yeah. So in those days, we had Kenya. I come, I'm born in Kenya, and Kenya was a British colonial uh, territory at the time. And we had school carrying a, a small slate on, with chalk. Now you use all those gadgets you have today, but our tablet in those days, <laughs> eh? our tablet, it's a kind of tablet, you know, but it's of course of a slate and chalk, so you could write the lab. Now these days you do something else, but actually that uh, the tablet of our days was a piece of chalk and a piece of blackboard, okay? Our piece of black slate, okay? So, I have brought a black slate and a white chalk for my writing material. We copy on our slates what the teacher has written on the blackboard. Later she comes around to grade on the slate, putting an X or a check against each word or number, totals them up, and then circles the cumulative number. At first, I do not realize that after she has graded, I still have to wait for her to, assess, to enter the number in a register for the record. I rub off my work as soon as the teacher has graded it. But when I go home and my mother asks me what and how I had done, and I say I rubbed off everything, she says, then don't. Wait for the teacher to tell you what to do. The teacher also corrects me. Otherwise, I would continue getting zero. And when later she starts writing on my slate, 10 out of 10, and my mother asks me what I had done, and I say 10 out of 10. She would ask probing questions, end with, ending with, is that the best you could have done? <laughs> <laughs> this is a question she will keep on asking in response to my schoolwork, 
class exercises and tests. Is that the best you could have done? Even when I tell her proudly that I scored 10 out of 10, she asks the question in different ways until I say, yes, I tried my best. Strange, she seems more interested in the process of getting there than actual results. So I drift through the initial classes, not quite, quite understanding why I have been moved from sub B to sub A to grade one, all within the same quarter, a skipping of classes that continues from term to term, so that within a year I'm in grade two. And still my mother continues to ask, is that the best you could have done? I don't know about the best I could have done. All I know is one day I am able to read on my own the Gekoyo primer we used in class titled Modo Merewa Gekoyo. Some sentences are simple, like the one captioning a drawing of a man, an axe on the ground, his face grimacing with pain as he holds his left knee in both hands, drops of blood trickling down. The picture actually is more interesting than the words, which are Kamau ete mete, ete mete kuru, ete mete neither noa. Kamau has cut himself. He has cut his leg. He has cut himself with an axe. I tackle long passages that do not have illustrations. There is a passage that I read over and over again. And suddenly, one day, I start hearing music in the words. God has given the Agricole a beautiful country, abundant in water, food, and luscious bush. The Agricole should praise the Lord all the time, for he's ever been generous to them. Even when not reading it, I can hear the music, the choices and uh, arrangements of the words, the cadence, the crescendo. I can't pick in one thing that makes it so beautiful and long lived in my memory. I realize that even written words can carry the music. I love these stories, particularly the choric melody. And yet, this is not a story, it is a descriptive statement. It does not carry an illustration. It is a picture in itself, and yet more than a picture and a description. It is music. Written words can also sing. Nighttime irritates me because I read by the light of an unreliable and coverless kerosene lantern. Paraffin means money, and there are days when the lamp has no oil. Most times I rely on the firelight of an unreliable duration. Daylight is always welcome. It allows the book of magic to tell me stories without interruptions, except when I have to do this or that chore. This ability to escape into a world of magic is worth my having gone to school. Thank you, mother. Thank you. <coughs> the school has opened my eyes, and when later in church I hear the words, I was blind, and now I see. From him, Amazing Grace, I remember Commandora School and the day I learned to read. So two things, I want to stress that question, the best <coughs> you could have done. It was a question which has stayed with me all the time, up to, I always ask myself that question. It does not matter how many books I've written, it doesn't matter how many languages which have been translated, it does not matter you know, how many honorary doctorates I get, I ask myself, or honors, I ask myself the same question, is that I hear my mother all the time asking me, is that the best you could have done? But she also had a different way of looking at story. 
I don't share that with you as well. What I told you earlier is in my memoir called Dreams in a Time of War. Okay, because I was born in 1938 during the Second World War, and by 1952, there was another war in Kenya, war against the British colonial presence in the country, led by Mau Mau. And my brother was one of the guerrilla fighters against the British. He was in the mountains as I was going to school. Now, the fact that my brother was in the mountains fighting against the British was a kind of contradiction because I went to a school headed by uh, somebody who was an officer of the British Empire. <laughs> so in this school, one of the best you know, elite schools in Kenya at the time, headed by the, you know, the headmaster who was the officer of the British Empire, and we are seeing God save the Queen, a long reign over us, and my brother is in the mountains fighting to ensure the queen does not <laughs> long over us. And this becomes a kind of, I, I wouldn't call it being torn, but it plays with me almost like those shadows I talked about, you know, where is there, not there. You know, I'm in this bubble, not in this bubble, you know. I'm in this school, but around the school, what is going on? People are fighting, you know, people are being killed, people are hung, and all that. These are going on. My, my brother is in the mountains and so on. And I'm keep on asking myself, you know, if my brother, if I, my brother is fighting against them, are they going to expel me from school? You know, or whatever, all those questions in my mind. Then other things come into the picture, you know, uh, God and Christianity and so on. And I see that God is, um, God is white and I cannot, Jesus is white and I cannot, uh, uh, and I, so we are, those questions are rising in my, in our discussions, you know, but it's one artist who comes to our school and he paints Christ as black. It's an argument. No, no. Because the picture we've seen of Jesus is blue eyed, blonde hair, long hair, and his followers, you know, blonde hair. And God, you know, the picture of God. And no. And this thing, what language does he speak? What, you know, so I close my eyes, to, so. Because everybody said God was speaking to them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, and I closed my eyes, and I, I mean, for me it's literal. So I wait for them for it to, hear, to hear God speaking in the coil. <laughs> I, listen, I don't hear. So I'm amazed by all those others who say categorically that God spoke to them. Okay? So I one time I remember asking somebody, in what language? Um, <laughs> yeah, see, I was very fascinated because he didn't speak to me in a coil and he didn't speak to me in English. But they were very categorical about, the lang about God speaking to them. So, and I couldn't really get an answer. So I went through the crisis, you know, sort of, you know, try this, try this. And, I, I, and nobody has ever given me that answer up to now. Maybe after this, you, one of you will tell me. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, by that time, my mother had separated with my father. A story I tell in reading the time of war. Okay. So I moved from a huge family, 25, 27 children, four mothers and a daddy and all that, you know, to a single parent, you know, a household, and my mother. So my next phase, and then I tell the story of what happened to me at Alliance High School, where I went to in the house of the interpreter. Now, one, my mother really liked working. She could work, both my parents could work magic on the land. I, I believe my mother could make anything grow, even on cement, <laughs> literally. You know, I mean, she was, I don't know what, how she, she did it, okay? Right. Well, my wife is telling me, don't forget. I can also make things grow. <laughs> we, you come, she, she has a very beautiful, I'm writing an epic poem on her garden actually, you know, at the UCI right now, uh, because she has transformed it into this blooming. She's made the desert in her backyard actually bloom. And uh, yeah, okay. So 
Is it traditional? Yeah. So one day, my younger brother, you know, and I go to visit her is during sort of break time. But I maybe first tell you about this. My mother was very good at roasting potatoes in the fields with ashes and so on. And I could never understand why the food in the house was never quite as tasty as what was sort of cooked in the field. Okay. So one day we go and visit her. It was always, whenever she wanted us to go to the garden, she would tell us that she would make roasted potatoes for us, you know. So that's also always an attraction to go and join her in the fields. And why we join her on this particular occasion is um, a garden, and there's a huge mogumo tree, a kind of fig tree with a huge trunk. It's a huge trunk and a very, very strong roots, okay? Now, I remember I told you that separated my father. But on this occasion, when the potatoes were about ready, who turns up? <laughs> my father. <laughs> and my, my younger brother, and my, I had had some kind of reconciliation with my father, but not my younger brother. So my younger brother, who had never had the same kind of reconciliation with him, with him that I once had, did not look on the visit generously. I'm sure he turns up only when he's hungry. <laughs> My mother was prompt in her censure. He still had the father. Don't you judge him. Let him judge himself. To smooth the awkward moment, I asked my mother about the story she'd once told us of how they had found each other. She just smiled and ignored my request. But my question, or rather visit, must have mellowed her, for suddenly she started talking with uncharacteristic openness about not him, but the tree. She believed that the fig tree was sacred and healing. For some reason, she made us look at its roots carefully. They were strong and deep, and that's why a Mugumo tree never succumbed to prevailing winds and changing weather and lasted many years. Do you know, she said, that this particular one has been here since before the coming of the colonizer, even before you are great, 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 great grandparents? When we asked her playfully, how she knew its age, she said it was time to resume work. <laughs> but then, as sometimes she answered, because people have lived here longer than the tree, and they tell the story, and they pass on the story, and we add to the story. I had never told her about my spiritual strivings, but she might have detected a restless in me, and the story might have been her way of touching on it. Many years later, my writing would start with a short story titled Mogumo, the Fig Tree. Now, the story that what we do is a campaign is we whether in physics or in history, you know, or whatever we do, we are adding to a story that has already been started by others. Okay, we add to the story. I think it's very important. But there's something which is important to a story. Obviously a story has some always kind of some kind of beginning. You don't begin a story in the middle, except for modern fiction. But even they, they have to go back to the beginning <laughs> sometimes. You know. But the story is very, very the beginning. And what? And the beginning, really, you begin where you are. The whole notion of starting point <coughs> has become very, very important in looking at realities of the world. When I look at colonization, for instance, or domination of kind, 
is real. It has a reason for it to alienate somebody from their starting point. You know, your starting point is who you are. It's so simple. If you are black, that's your starting point. If you have this kind of orientation, that's your starting point. If you are mixed, that's your starting point. It's not a problem, but we make it a problem. The starting point should not be a problem because it's never really a problem until you make it a problem. When I want to move here to my office, I start from where I am. I don't try to kind of jump or do something else. You start from when you go adding to the story of your journey to my office and back. But we've been to worry about our starting point as it's a problem. If you are born this, you don't, you don't apply to be born either white or black or whatever. I mean, <laughs> you're born into that. That's your starting point, is what you do with it. OK? Colonialism, for example, would make African people want to change their names. If you read my memo, you say, what about am I Young, am I James, and so on. But what's wrong with my name, Gobi? Well, you know, I mean, I can add others if I want to, but it's no problem. But I, I made, made to think my, my name was a problem. I was made to think that my skin is a problem. I was made to think that my history is a problem, that my Kenya base is a problem. No, it is my starting point of my journey in the story of life. And my starting point is no better or worse than anybody's starting point. What matters is what you do or what I do with my starting point. That's not a problem. It should never be a problem. It's what I do with it. Okay? The choices I make, the ethics, the ethics or the choices I make, that's what's important. And that's what the story has really taught me. And even I used to reform in whatever I do, even also my theoretical works are also there. And maybe have noted how my theoretical works, I, tell, I just tell a story. <laughs> I, I tell a story of how I came to certain theoretical positions, because I think it's fascinating, mm. okay? Whether I'm right to colonize the mind or global ethics and so on. And so I want to end up with one story. Okay, all this story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you called me at Rutgers, actually I was a guest of uh, a family uh, from Kenya, but they teach at, you know, uh, at Rutgers College called uh, Alamin Mazrui. And he's married to uh, a lady, other professor of linguistics from Niger, West Africa, and a little girl. Uh, Called uh, what is it? Uh, peace. What is what for peace in Swahili? Ima, not Iman, the other one. Okay, anyway, she's like, yeah, never mind. It's coming to mind. <laughs> Salama, Salma, 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 Salama, like Salma. Okay. Four years ago, when I was there in Rutgers, she was only four years old. She drew a picture of me, okay, and she gave me a most touch. But I know that. The body and the mustache were two separate things. That was body and the mustache. Sama, you know, what's wrong? It was if, you know, I, the, the mustache is not touched. Oh, she said, oh, don't worry. It's a flying mustache. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this time I went back, and she was she's 80 years old, and she remembered the flying mustache. No. Yeah. So we talked about the flying mustache all the time when I was there. And towards the end, at, uh, we, I first went to Bimmy Hunter. So we were making a, a story about the flying mustache. Okay? Then I created a song. But by the time I came to Rati, I'd forgotten. But she remembered it and the dance. So in the streets as we were going for French at uh, Rati Gas, she remembered the story of the flying uh, and the dance she was marked and the music. Okay? So I want to share that with you right now. And then we shall end there. One. Flying touch, okay? When I say, did you see it? You say, yes, okay? You are pointing, you say, yes. Did you catch it? 
No. Because it flies, see? Freedom. So, did you see it? Yes. Did you catch it? No. no. Okay. Now, let's see. <coughs> flying mustache. Flying mustache. Did you see it? Yes. 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 Did you catch it? No. Did you catch it? No. Did you catch it? No. Ah, it flies in freedom. And the story always embodies freedom. Thank you. custom and what matters to me uh, after the talk we open the floor for questions and answers uh, there are mics on either side uh, just a few ground rules please speak up because we want to capture the recording uh, but don't be shy Yes, thank you for your very kind words and readings. They're very profound. I have a question, though. Uh, did uh, spirituality or uh, religion or faith have any uh, impact on you in your writings and your development? Yeah, spirituality is very important uh, to me, as I think it is. Uh, important to everybody's spirituality because after all what's the what's human is really our ethical dimension which it comes from the choices we actually make and so on you know uh, that's you know very important but I have and I don't want to really disparage anybody you know people find spirituality you know religion they try to kind of try to embody or find ways of embodying this notion of the spiritual, you know. But I'm afraid that most religion, or rather all religions, former religions, I'm sorry, but it's to strangle spirituality, they squeeze spirituality out of, well, life really, you know. Uh, they get wonderful books like the Bible, the Quran, which are very, very spiritual, of the Book of Light by Buddha, and so on, you know. And every Sunday or every occasion, they squeeze spirituality out of it. So sometimes they give you the shell of, you know, like, you know, when you squeeze, like when you wash clothes and you squeeze them to get out of water, that thing that's left, yeah? Okay. So, spirituality is very, very important. It's very, very important to me. And I think a lot of religious, uh, they try to get at this spirituality, but sometimes the process, the rituals by which they try to reach spirituality has become more important than the spirituality itself. So, whether you were ahead or walked on one foot or walked on one leg or not, becomes now more important, you know, than the reason why it was commanded you walk on one foot rather than two or whatever, okay? So, that's my kind of uh, spirit. But spiritual is very, very important because we don't live to eat. We eat if we like to, <laughs> to live in order for something else, you know, is there something else? which differences are for, from, um, say, animal life and so is that spirituality, that thing which is the universe, you know, I cannot put my finger on it, but I have a feeling it is there somewhere, uh, except when people try to squeeze it out of us. And I, I think it seems to me the struggle is how to recover the sense of the spiritual. I 
thank you. Uh, you've written many stories, and you talk about the importance of stories. What's the favorite story that you have read or have ever been told? Yeah. That has never been told. Oh, I can tell you, I, I've got one. <laughs> the best story that I know of is a story I've not yet written. <laughs> yeah. And it's the story I strive to write or to tell. And every time I think I've told it, I can hear my mother's voice asking me, is really that the best you could have done? <laughs> so I go back to the drawing board. <laughs> yeah. So it's to be done. OK, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, looking back on some of the darker times in your life, whether it was in prison or other incidents of violence that you were subjected to, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on forgiveness. Uh, for, oh yeah, he's referring to the fact that at one time, because the stories, the story sent me to prison once. <laughs> for max, not just in a maximum security prison. And how did I cope when I was at prison? I thought my salvation is how do I cope with prison? You know, whenever it's supposed to kill, especially a writer, you're not allowed to write, you're not allowed to do anything, and so on, you know. Uh, so the only way, way I could actually literally deal with my prison conditions, maximum security prison, for doing nothing more than just a play, uh, which kept to, I'm sure. And I should. Announced, by the way, that I'll get to Catherac is here, that they are going to do, and you're invited. Are they invited to? Yes, everyone's invited. Yeah, they are going to do, they're doing the trial of Dan and Kimathi, the play. And the guy who is going to play Kimathi was here. Where is he? <laughs> huh? Kimathi, can you stand up? <laughs> can, can they? Can they, can they hear your booming voice? <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is OG, uh, and I'm in the drama department. So we're going to be doing his play next season. So come see it. <laughs> there you are. You need to find yourself. Yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, I mean, this, how do I cope with prison there? Story helped me. So in prison, I wrote the novel, Devil on the Cross, in a coil on toilet paper. It was very, very important for me to be able to do that. You know. Uh, second time, my wife and I returned to Kenya after three years of in exile. What happened? We are attacked by, we returned to Kenya for the first time in 22 years, returning at the fall of the leadership. We in a hotel room about literally two blocks away from the central police station. Uh, we are attacked. My wife is sexually assaulted, and so on. So how do we come out of that trauma? Is by refusing to succumb to the, to the, the negatives. To the, you have to find a way of not letting the negative overwhelm you. Because if you let it overwhelm you, your enemy has won. OK? But if you refuse, you rise above it. Not above it, you don't forget it's still there. You are winning because your enemy wanted you to think. OK? You refuse. You kind of uh, forgive, but not forget. You forgive as an active by clinging on to the positive that, for instance, if you escape that kind of assault and you come out alive, you know, you can either do one or two things, think about the negative, it's because of, because of overwhelming, or you can cling to, oh, we've come out of it, and there are all the people who are surrounding us, you know, there are the women who will meet my wife in the streets and so regular, ordinary men and women. And they would somehow surround her and so on. 
you know. So what, what do you want to cling to? To the women who are surrounding you and lift you up and all that, you know, uh, or to the people who want to destroy you. Mm? So it's in that context that I think of uh, uh, forgiveness, yeah. And for me, forgiveness to do the best that I can, okay? So that my enemy, all that is, the negative forces, you know, can see I'm still, <laughs> I'm still going strong, okay? So I turn tables around, you know. They see us walking, and we are very proud when we return to Kenya, we see work, you know, in the newspapers and television and so on, you know. You say, oh, my sure those people who are attacking us, who never thought we would ever return to Kenya. And we go there uh, now and then. We have time for uh, about two or three more questions. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank you all for coming, and please let us give a hand to Louis Wakayama. Thank you.